So my sophomore year at Pepperdine, um, I got the opportunity to study abroad in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, and the way the program works is you go over there with 50 other students and you live in this gigantic house together and you like take classes together. And, and a faculty family from Pepperdine goes over with you and lives in the house with you. And so, um, you know, I was really excited about this opportunity and we got over there and the, the group I was with was a little uh, crazy, uh, a little wild. Corey Howard was there with me, and he, he would probably tell you, you know, that it was a rough crew, you know. So it was a rough crew to be with. Um, just kind of didn't handle the freedom well over there of alcohol and, and traveling and all that kind of stuff. And so for me, being kind of a sheltered Church of Christ Southern, Southern California kid, being thrown into that situation where all of a sudden I felt completely alone in kind of living out of faith. Uh, you know, I felt completely isolated in the house, and, and it really became something that I had never really been challenged that way before with my faith. Not so much does God exist, but I started to doubt and question how serious I am about my faith. And, and am I really going to stick to my guns and live this out even in this scenario of it being terrible and, and being isolated and not feeling like I'm connecting with anyone in the group because I'm not going out late at night and drinking and drunk and all that kind of stuff. And so for me, that year was rough. It was really rough because because I was constantly being tested. And it was a very, it was a very stressful, pressure-filled situation. And for me, the faculty family that went over with us was Gary and Tammy Selby. And for me, that they were kind of my rock. Um, every week we would have a, a house church uh, Sunday evening is basically, you know, we just come together and sing some songs and take communion. But, but for me, I, just, I developed a relationship with Gary and Tommy, Tammy Selby, and I was able to kind of bounce these frustrations and these questions and, and all this stuff off of Gary and Tammy. And, and that space, that, that house church space, that, that was my church really for that year, that relationship with Gary and Tammy became my my space that kind of kept my sanity a little bit. You know, Gary would speak into my life saying, you know, it's okay. This is not going to last forever. You're going to make it through this. Stick to your guns. It's okay. And it was a rough year, but I grew a lot because of that opportunity of being tested and having the space in church to be able to question and be able to kind of wrestle with this stuff in kind of an open, vulnerable way. And, and now looking back on it, you know, that was the toughest year of my life so far. But I wouldn't give that year up for anything because my faith was solidified through that experience. And, and the space that I had with Gary and Tammy Selby, with, with House Church, really allowed that growth and that solidification for me to, to, to happen. And, and, and it became something that all of a sudden I came out of that year so much stronger and so much more grounded in my faith than I had going in. And so for me, that, that opportunity, yeah, it was rough and difficult, and there were times where I hated it. But it was, it was the process and, and the ability to question and have that space with Gary and Tammy Selby that allowed me to grow and really kind of step into a faith of my own. And that was my experience. So, uh, doubts drive death. Say that with me. Doubts drive death. That's kind of what I'm hearing from Brendan sharing. Uh, I appreciate Tom's talk this morning. At communion, I, I always feel like if he offered an invitation, I'd go forward. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you are going to get to hear him preach outside of the communion time, too, which we're looking forward to. Is it June uh, 9th or somewhere in there? June 16th, June 9th, June 2nd, I think. But Tom's actually going to preach, and looking forward to that. But what Tom laid out is kind of... Uh, Really speaking to also what I think Brendan was laying out in that we live between confusion and clarity. 
all of our lives. Confusion versus clarity. Why can we rejoice? Because the grave is empty. Hallelujah. Praise God. Why are you weeping? We can be certain Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. But we live in doubt. And we live in confusion. So this morning, I'm continuing with part two of our series of walking with the next generation. And I won't make you come up front again, but I will make you raise your hand. If you're between the ages of 19 and 29 years old this morning, anybody between ages of 19 and 29, can you raise your hand? Keep them up for just a moment. Okay? Quite a few of us. All right, put them down. Statistics show 60% of you will not be a part of a church. That you will withdraw from any church life during that period of time. Somebody asked why we're doing this series. Because we are losing the next generation in droves. They are fleeing from the church. And of course we don't want that to happen. We love them. But we need to ask why. And not be afraid of the answers that we're hearing. Tens of thousands, tens of thousands of young adults between 19 and 20 year old were surveyed. Tens of thousands that went to church and then later left church were asked tons of questions about why they left the Christian, not necessarily the Christian faith, but they left the church. Last week we talked about one of the things they said is the church is overprotective. And if you want to know what that means, you can go to our website, watch last week's lesson about how the church is seen as overprotective. We talk about this as well. This has come out in many different books have been written on this, that the next generation loves Jesus, but not the church. That's sad. Jesus, I'm great. Yeah, I love Jesus. This whole religion, institution thing, I, I'm just not down with that. There's doubts that are there. And you've heard me say there's a problem because, well, for example, uh, Joel and Colleen, no embarrass you guys for just a minute. Okay, they're friends, boyfriend, girlfriend. <laughs> if, if you were to say to Colleen, Colleen, I love your head, but I don't love your body. How do you think that would go over? Yeah. I love your head, but I don't love your body. You would not say that. <laughs> you are a wise man. But if you say, I, I love Jesus, <laughs> but I don't love your body. We are the body of Christ. Okay? This is with flaws and strengths and faults and giftedness and good, the bad, the ugly. We are the body of Christ. And Jesus says, you are my body. So if you say, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church, there's an incongruency that is there. But we have to find out why. We have to hear why. And so we're identifying six things that have come out in a recent study by David Kinneman called You Lost Me. Why the next generation is leaving the church. Why we're losing the next generation. And we're going to go through another five of those. This morning, as already has been alluded to, is this issue of doubt. Many young adults, adults don't feel that they can voice their doubts in church. They don't feel they can ask those real tough questions. They don't feel safe expressing doubts in the community. And that's a problem. And we're not, we're not, this, we're not trying to blame anybody here. That's not what this is about. We're trying to explore. Are there some things that we can learn? I would say yes. I think the next generation has a lot to teach us. They offer us a lot of hope, and I'm so proud of our young adults. But they're going to help us learn some things. 
And if they don't feel this way, whether you agree with it or not, that's the way they feel. It's one of the reasons they expressed why they would leave a church. So God's call has always been, God's call has always been for his family, his community, to be a safe place to have doubts. All type of doubts. I kind of went through a similar phase as Brendan where I, where I had my doubts and I had to ask myself, Am, do I really believe this Christian stuff? And really when you get to 19, you're out of the house over those next few years, you know, you're not being forced to go to church necessarily anymore, right? So you can ask, you know, do I believe this because I believe this? Because I was forced to? Or do I really believe this thing called Christianity? That a man named Jesus died and was buried and three days later rose from the dead. Do I believe that and do I want to live my life following this Jesus, this man named Jesus and, and being a part of his family? And there's doubts that we all have, right? In other words, do you have things that you doubted, that, that you were convicted about 10 to 20 years ago that you now doubt? I do. I came out of college sure about certain things, but some of those things I doubt. And I also had doubts that now, 10, 15, 20 years later, I'm certain about certain things, you see? It's like confusion to clarity. And sometimes we go back and forth, and that is okay. Is the church going to be a safe place for the next generation to wrestle with their doubts, to express their doubts, even doubts about, I don't know if I even believe in Jesus. I don't know if I believe in this thing called church. I don't necessarily like some things that I see in church. How do I wrestle with that? How do I respond to that? And will we open Will we be an open church to explore and navigate those life's most, not the easy stuff, difficult, difficult, hard questions. Questions about the institution of church. Tr questions about our traditions. Uh oh. Do we have any unspoken rules in church sometimes that might raise some red flags? We're going to deal with a, a question that is very visceral and real next Sunday that I guarantee you is going to be awkward for many of us here. And that is, how does the church respond to same-sex attraction? How does the church, what is a church's biblical Christian response to a gay lifestyle? These are the questions, deep questions that are being asked. And we don't necessarily have all the answers. God does. Right? But that is a journey. See, that, that's, faith is a journey. That's the journey we are on and we need to be on together. And, and we are dealing with things now that, or the young, young adults are dealing with things we never had to deal with. It's different. Things have changed. And how we deal with those things need to change. Not the truth of Jesus Christ. That has never changed. Here's saying today, uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, that's going to be the same, right? But how we deal with those changes and ask those questions is extremely important. Can you think of, these are just a few examples of times of hundreds, thousands of men and women throughout the history of God in the Bible wrestled with doubts. And God accepted those people where they were. And the church should accept them too as, as we move forward from confusion to clarity. I mean, just a few examples. Somebody, somebody mentioned Gideon this morning. Did Gideon have doubts? You remember the story of Gideon and the police? He had huge doubts. It's like, God, I don't know about this. You sure you got the right guy? You sure you want me? Well, you put some police out on the whole wet and dry thing, right? Well, I'm not. Let me put it out one more time in case I, that was an accident, right? <laughs> he wrestled with doubts. King David, can you read the Psalms and, and, and come away not thinking David ever had doubts? Of course not. Almost every Psalm. Why, Lord? Why is this happening? 
That's another thing, is that when, when we go through moments of crisis, we can have a doubt. That can be, in fact, you might be in crisis right now, and, and if your faith is challenged, and you are going through the loss of a loved one, if you are wrestling with discouragement, if you wrestle with depression, can you tell anybody? If you are wrestling with a deep sin, do you just keep it that private? Or is the church, and not all the church, I'm not saying you need to stand up and share it with everyone, no. But are there people in this church you can go to and talk about the sin that you are wrestling with? Or do you have to put on a mask like we talked about last week and become this whitewashed sepulcher full of dead men's bones? Everything's beautiful on the outside, but rotting on the inside. Can we be a place where you can express your struggles, no matter how dark and how deep they are. That's what God's community is called to. King David is an example of that. Job is an example of that. You move to the New Testament, we even named a guy, even though he's not called this in the Bible, we named him Doubting Thomas. I said, oh, shame on Thomas, you have doubts. We all have doubts. Did you know every single one of the apostles doubted whether Jesus rose from the dead or not? After he rose from the dead, everybody doubted. But they were moved towards conviction. Jesus, God, walked with them. And we are called to walk with each other. To ask those tough, tough <coughs> questions. I love this story in Mark chapter 9. Do you remember uh, right after the transfiguration? That Jesus and Peter, James, and John come off the mountain and they're trying to heal the guy down below at the bottom of the mountain. And they're praying and they think, ah, I've got faith and we're trying and they're laying hands on and nothing's happening. He's not being healed. And Jesus gets off the mountain and he's scratching his head. He's like, well, what's going on? And we can't heal him. Oh, you, oh, come on. You have little faith. So, you see in verse 20, they brought this boy. When the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into violent convulsion. He fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. Can you imagine that? This, this power that's the evil there. Jesus like, how long has he been like that? He asked the voice, Father, he replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into fire into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. That's the place of doubt where we all can be. What's the doubt? If you can, have mercy and heal us if you can. I don't know, you see. Jesus like, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe. But help me overcome my unbelief. We live between certainty and confusion. I do believe. Help me un overcome my unbelief. I'm wrestling with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Oh, we know 1 Corinthians chapter 13 because it is the chapter on what? Love. You know how it starts out? If I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am nothing. If I can fathom all mysteries... But have not love, I have nothing. You down, love is patient, love is kind, does not even does not boast, it's not proud. It's a great chapter on love. But look what it said after that. Verse 8. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. If you know everything and church comes across as we know everything, there's a problem because we don't know everything. God knows everything, and only God knows everything. We don't know it all. And so, love will last forever. Verse 9, knowledge is partially incomplete. Even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. Verse 10, but when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and I thought, reason is a child. When I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but when we see everything with perfect, we will see everything with perfect clarity. And that I know now is partial and incomplete, but I will know everything completely just as God 
knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. NIV says, now we see things through a mere dimly. Now we see things through a mere dimly. But when the perfect Jesus Christ comes again, or we go home to meet him in heaven, everything will be made clear. But now it's through a mere dimly. The older I get, the more I like that dim mirror. <laughs> so doubts drive death. Say that with me. Doubts drive death. That's why doubts are a good thing. And if you have doubts, that's why we can welcome them. Because you ask those tough questions. It's not just because mom or dad said, or this is what I was always taught. you got to go back to the word. you got to pray. you got to study. you got to seek wise counsel. Doubts are good because they will drive your faith to death. Or they will drive you away. And that's the challenge of doubts, you see. Doubts. You can stay paralyzed in doubts. If you question everything, if you just keep on doubting and you never move to clarity or conviction, Satan, in a sense, has you where he wants you. He wants us to live in doubt. By the way, I, I don't think doubt is the opposite of faith. I think unbelief is the opposite of faith. Doubt is a part of, of who we are, given our brains that we're to use those and and, and we'll let those doubts drive us towards death. You see, we are on a journey, right? Can we be a church where we journey together with these questions and with these doubts? Now, we move towards clarity and conviction. Romans 8, 38 says, listen, there are some things you can be certain of. There's some things you can be sure of. Paul tells us in Corinthians chapter 15, for the most important, that's not on the screen here, but I want you to hear this. He says, the most important thing is this, that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead. That's the most important thing, and we need to move towards conviction on that. And if you are not convinced of that, you're not alone, because Paul is right in the church saying you need to be convinced of that. Why? Because they weren't convinced of that. A man rising from the dead? Jesus, God in the flesh? Paul says, you're never going to be able to figure that out completely. It's a mystery beyond me. That Jesus and God could be one. But what you do need to be certain of is God loves you. Jesus died for your sins and my sins and all of our sins. He paid the price for our sins. He was in the ground for three days. And then he rose from the dead to give us hope. And that's the most important thing. And the farther we get away from that, sometimes the more confusing things will be. But that's where it starts. Romans 8, 38, Paul says this, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from the love of God. And that's the clarity we need. God loves you. So much he gave you, Jesus Christ. You can be certain of that. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Faith is the confidence that we hope for will actually happen. It will happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. And so that is, why can we rejoice? Why do we not have to weep? Because Jesus is risen from the dead. And you can be confident of that. But we live in confusion. We're moving towards clarity. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 4. What I receive, I pass on you. This is the first importance. Christ died for our sins. According to Scripture, he was buried. He rose from the dead on the third day. According to Scriptures. And if you're not sure about it, he says there's 500 people at one time that saw him after he rose from the dead. You can talk to this person and this person and this person and this person. And you can know Jesus rose from. You can be certain he rose from the dead. We can be certain of that. So where do we go with our confusion? Where do we go with our doubts? Is this a safe place? Is Hilltop Church going to be a safe place for you to ask anything and have doubts no matter how deep they are? Here's one thing for sure about the next generation. 
They are teaching us to serve like never before. We're going back to basics, all right? We all know Jesus called us to be servants, right? Guess who's leading the way on serving the community, serving the oppressed, serving the poor, serving the downtrodden? Our next generation is calling us back to that. Praise God for that. We can learn from them. So what do we do? We come alongside and we serve and allow for questions to coexist with certainty. We're not going to go wrong if we're serving in the name of Jesus. Let's serve. Let's come alongside. Let them show us how. Let them lead the way and let them ask questions and move from, as all of us are, by the way, moving from confusion to clarity. Doubts and conviction do not have to remain in tension. They are in tension. I understand that. And it seems like they're polar opposites. But they can coexist in God's church. Here's what I want you to do this morning. And we're going to be done. But I want you to think about yourself for a moment. And do we have a song? <clears throat> Praise me. Sing. Okay, not yet. but Because I want you to reflect on something. Are there doubts that you have right now in your life? I'm not going to ask you to share them. But if you have doubts that you wrestle with, doubts about faith, doubts about church, doubts about God, doubts about anything, then I want you to take a, a black balloon. Listen carefully. Don't tie the balloon. <laughs> And don't pass out if you blow up a balloon. <laughs> For us next generation, older generation. Uh, all right. But what I want you to do is I want you, is, is if you have doubts and you want to kind of just lay those doubts before God, I want you to blow up the black balloon. And be thankful that you can acknowledge this is a safe place to have doubts. Any doubt. And if you want to thank God for your convictions, and maybe you're le learning, leaning more towards those convictions this morning, then I want you to blow up the red balloon. Don't tie them. I know that's the natural thing. But I want you just to blow those up. So take those balloons, both those balloons. And maybe you want to blow up both, okay? Maybe this morning you feel like you're wrestling with doubts and you're thankful for your convictions. If that's the case, I want you to blow up both balloons and hold on to them. And I'll be back up in a moment uh, to share one more thing. Hold those balloons. Don't let them go and don't tie them. Let's reflect. Let's pray. And let's uh, blow those balloons up.
So, how many of you, if you could just hold up your black balloon, everybody look around. You, hold it up, are not alone. Every, so many people here are wrestling with doubts even now. And Hilltop is going to be a place, this family, where you can ask any question, wrestle with, journey with, walk together with your doubts. Ask those questions. Have someone pray for you. Have someone pray for you. Pray with them. Seek wise counsel. Study God's word. Listen to the Holy Spirit. I almost get tired holding this thing. Okay. I guess doubts are kind of heavy. <laughs> uh, okay, put them down for a moment, but hang on to it. And for those who are thankful for your convictions, hold up the red balloons. So we really have both. Yelene, I see your red balloon there. Very good. What we want to do is like sweet incense floating up to the Father. Let them go on the count of three. Are you ready? We're going to let them go before God this morning. Our doubts, we're, we're giving them to the Lord. Our convictions, we're thankful for. We live between certainty and confusion on three. Hold on, some people are blown up. Don't pass out. <laughs> One, two, three. Three. All right. Give God a hand. I uh, really hope you'll take seriously the call. And, and you know what scared the next generation away? It's the way we've answered their questions. Hear that, church. That's a stupid question. There's no stupid questions. Why don't you just read your Bible and you'd understand all this. I never have doubts. Why are you doubting? Don't you know God wants you to be sure that the things you hope for commence of the things unseen? So, who would want to ask a question in that environment? So you know where the onus is? On the person receiving the question to realize that's where that person is at. They've come to you in confidence. You may be there too, or you may have been there at once, whatever, for whatever reason. We can talk through and realize this is a journey. Be patient, because God is patient with you, even 